Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Bronx Library Center. My name is Melissa Davis, and I'm the managing librarian here. It's nice to see you all here at the library on a Monday night to celebrate reading and books that shape us. First things first, raise your hand if you have a library card. Okay, good. So if your hand isn't up, I encourage you to stop by our table outside following the program. It's very easy and will give you access to the special world of books we are here to talk about tonight. I received my first library card at the Parkchester Library around 1980-something. <laughs> but it was not until my senior year in high school that I started visiting the library regularly. In June of 2000, I applied for a part-time position um, at the Classens Point Library as a clerical staff member, and little did I know that 19 years later, I'll be standing here before you as the managing librarian. Thank you. I can't tell you how excited we are to host Sonia Manzano here. Growing up, watching Sesame Street, you know, she was a role model for us Latina girls. We didn't have many actresses or um, authors to look up to, so I'm very proud and excited that she is here with us. I also want to thank Angela Yee for her work as an NYPL ambassador. In the midst of all her other jobs as a nationally syndicated radio host, an entrepreneur, and a writer, Angela still finds the time and the voice to make sure that New Yorkers know about the services and resources available to them for free at the local library. How many people know everything we have here is completely free? Yeah. Okay, I should see all hands raised at this point, okay. And I can't leave the stage without saying a big thank you to our partners in this series, the National Book Foundation and the New York Department of Cultural Affairs. This is the second year we have partnered on Notes from the Reading Life. You can find recordings of last year's conversations with Tim Gunn, Thelma Goldwyn, and Desus Nice on the NYPL and NBF websites. Tonight is the third and final event in this series of three conversations featuring New York mainstays, Brian Lear, Lear Sarah Jessica Parker, and of course, Sonia Manzano, all talking about the books they love the most. This partnership has also enabled us to provide free copies of, of a very important book, one that Sonia Manzano identified as a favorite, The Warmth of Other Sons by Isabel Wilkerson. We will be hosting a book discussion on that title here on July 27th at 1 p.m. Everyone should have received a copy and a flyer and we hope to see you on July 27th. I hope you will read or reread the book and join us to continue the conversation then. You can find the rest of Sonia's reading list in your printed program. It is now my pleasure to introduce Natalie Green, Pu Public Programs Manager at the National Book Foundation. Please give a big round of applause for Natalie and enjoy the evening. Thank you, Melissa. So I'm Natalie and I'm new to New York three weeks in, so I need to get on getting a library card. I say at my third event in a library in three weeks. Thanks to everyone at the Bronx Library Center, including Melissa, for hosting this event in our series, Notes from the Reading Life. We're honored and delighted that Sonia Manzano is here with us tonight for the finale of our series to discuss the ways in which books have helped shape her life with Angela Yee. Before we begin, I'd like to tell you just a little bit about the National Book Foundation. Sorry in advance, but gotta do what I gotta do. Our mission is to celebrate the best literature in America, expand its audience, and ensure that books have a prominent place in American culture. One way we do that is through the National Book Awards, which, since 1950, have celebrated great books, with honorees ranging from William Carlos Williams and Rachel Carson to Lydia Davis and ta Coates. Our work includes a wide variety of educational programs, which by the end of this summer will have given away one million books to children living in public housing authorities nationwide. Our public programs, thanks. <laughs> mm -hmm. Our public programs bring National Book Award honored authors to book festivals, college campuses, performance houses, and public libraries across the country. And please sign up for our newsletter, which is out front where you checked in, to stay up to date. We're delighted and grateful um, to the New, New York Public Library for this partnership in every single way. Many thanks, like Melissa said, are due to the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs for their generous support. 
which helped provide free copies of The Warmth of Other Suns. And now to the main event. As for the format of tonight's program, Sonia and Angela will have a conversation for about 40 minutes, and then we'll have time for a few questions from the audience. If you have a question, please hold it until the end, then raise your hand up and we'll bring a microphone over to you. After the program, we hope you'll stick around and join us for continued conversation and refreshments. And since this is an intimate house, if you wanna move up a little closer, I welcome, I encourage that. I see two people moving and I love that energy. And now for our guests. Our moderator, Angela Yee, began her career in radio at Sirius XM on Eminem station Shade 45. She went from being a co-host and the only woman on the entire station to getting her own morning show. After six years, she left to start The Breakfast Club at iHeartMedia, and for the past nine years, she has been breaking stories, conducting groundbreaking interviews, and giving earnest expert advice. Angela became the first New York Public Library ambassador and the first ever global ambassador for diversity, inclusion, and community engagement for Brooklyn Sports and Entertainment. And Angela will be interviewing Sonia Manzano, who for over 40 years inspired, educated, and delighted children and families as Maria on Sesame Street. Named among the 25 greatest Latino role mod models ever by Latina Magazine, Sonia broke ground as one of the first Hispanic characters on national television. A first-generation American of Latin descent, Sonia was raised in the South Bronx and came to star in the original production of Godspell before joining the production of Sesame Street. Sonia's latest books are her memoir, Becoming Maria, and picture book, Miracle on 133rd Street. Twice nominated for an Emmy for Outstanding Performer in a Children's Series, Sonia has also appeared numerous times on stage and in film. Please welcome Sonia and Angela. Thank you. First of all, let me say it's an honor for me to be here with Sonia. I'm a little nervous. Oh. <laughs> Thank you, that's nice of you to say. We all know and love you so much, so it's exciting to have you here. And you are from the South Bronx, so let's talk about that a little bit, because it has to feel good being here right now. It's, 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 I always love, you know, I tried to get out of the Bronx when I was a kid, and now I can't stay out of the Bronx. <laughs> Though I have to say, I was just trying to remember if there was a library near me, and I don't remember ever going to a library when I, uh, though there must have been, uh, I don't recall ever going to a library, I'm, so I'm glad to visit this facility. Well, let's talk about your journey a little bit because we know you as, of course, the beloved character Maria on Sesame Street, and we know how much representation matters. So let's talk about how you ended up on Sesame Street and what that has meant to so many people. It, it, it's not a really fabulous story. I was in the right place at the right time and, and when I was cast, but it, it, it really it meant so much to me because uh, I saw the show when I was a student at Carnegie Mellon University, and when I saw Susan and Gordon, I flipped because I was raised in the South Bronx, born in New York, watched a lot of television, and I never saw anybody who looked like me in the remotest way or or lived in a neighborhood that was kind of similar to mine. And at that time, Sesame Street had a very kind of uh, uh, Harlem look to it. You know, it was a brownstone, and they really went out of their way. So it looked like an urban show. So when I saw Susan and Gordon, I said, oh my god, what are these people? This is really cool. When I was a kid, you'd see a person of color on TV, and you'd call the neighbors. It was like really unheard of, and this is 1969. I know it's hard for younger people to understand this. People say, what are you talking about? They're, well, the Cosby kids. I'm saying, no, I'm talking about before, before the Cosby kids. So, uh, so then uh, when I got the call to audition for, they wanted to have some Latinos on the show as well as African-American characters, uh, I, you know, I was able I, to get the part in you know, and found my way after a year. I was really nervous and didn't know what I was doing in front of the camera. I was just being on stage. The camera's like, whoa, wait a minute. <laughs> Did you even realize at that time the impact that you were having? I could not have known. I, you know, it was like, uh, even though it was a groundbreaking show, everybody was thrilled. We thought it would last a year or two. 
we could not imagine how long it was going to last. We were satirized on Saturday Night Live. They called it Reality Street and had all these, these questionable <laughs> characters, you know, <laughs> nodding off in the corners. And yes. so I thought, where is it going to go now? <laughs> All right, and what about speaking Spanish on the show and actually having some representation of things that you felt were more realistic for your character? I think it's, it's the power of television was really felt in that people always say to me, you taught me Spanish. I didn't teach them Spanish. We did like five words, <laughs> 10 <laughs> words in Spanish. But you know, you just show people something different mm -hmm. and they go, mm -hmm. they take it someplace else. So I think that I can, I can take credit for that, <laughs> for that certainly. Now you also have your own memoirs and you talk about TV as, was kind of an escape for you when you were younger, so discuss that because I think a lot of people can relate to that. I was raised in a household ruled by domestic violence and it, it was a whirlwind of violence, running away, coming back, I mean, it was endless. So I used to find sanctuary watching television. I loved Leave it to Beaver, Father Knows Bad, all those shows you can see on TV land today. And it was like looking through a hole. I mean, I used to think, where do those people live? And where is that, that suburban, I mean, you know, it was like Yonkers or something or Long Island, but it was such an exotic place to me as a little kid. I lost my point. I had a point in there somewhere. But oh, we're uh, talking about, <laughs> yeah, you watching television. Yes, and I found, and I found, you know, I would make, you know, trying to make order of the world by what I saw on television, even though there was nobody like me. So that when I got on Sesame Street, I always re I always think, you know, there must be another kid watching TV and trying to sort of, you know, put f notes together or facts together. And I think that's why I was able to stay on the show for so long. I also think that way about books, and we're going to talk about some of the books that influenced you early on in life, because I think about some of the books that we had to read when I was growing up in school and how I learned a lot of things. Like, I remember I learned about girls getting their period from Are You There, God? It's Me, Margaret. <laughs> and I think I learned about scoliosis from reading about Deanie and things like that. And these were things I didn't know about from my family, but... These were also people that didn't look like me, that I'm reading these books about them. So what were some of the early books that you read that you learned from that you can remember? I read a Beverly Clearly book. Ramona. Right, the, right, right. the Ramona. She wrote the Ramona series, but it was, a, it was a book called 15. And in those days, you, you had library in school, but you couldn't take a book home. So I would read it, and then I'd remember the last page and put it back in, until the next. Well, then, of course... I, it, it was uh, uh, there was a part. It was interesting because she was a white suburban girl, but it, I related to it because when she displeased her mother, she tried to like clean the house and put, set the dinner table. And I, every kid has done that, you know. Let me just distract mom with some good deed here, and she won't even notice that I've you know broken a rule. So that I related to her on that on that level, on a little emotional thing like that. And I uh, didn't finish the book years later. I'm 35 years old years later, and I walk into a, a, a library in a rural Pennsylvania town, and there's 15 <laughs> on the And I finished the book. <laughs> Yeah, and I remember some other books I read growing up. I used to love these Sweet Valley High books. They were like little uh, high school romance stories. But again, I didn't see any representation of myself in there. So do you recall any books where you were like, okay, that's me that you had to read growing up? The only one that was remotely like me was when I was Puerto Rican and uh, Esmeralda Santiago. So, of course, that was, uh, you know... She talks about, she, and her experience started in Puerto Rico, and I had never even been there. So, but that was like, uh, you know, somebody like me, her story was so interesting. She's a Brooklyn girl. Uh, so uh, uh, that was one that I really, I really related to. Now, you also have picked your five picks um, of books that you want people to read that inspired you. So let's discuss some of those books that you picked. The Known World. The known world is, uh, uh, he's a, he, he was a postal worker from D.C., Edward P. Jones, and Virginia had, had slaves like many southern states, but they kept records 
clear records of who owned who and for how long and what the racial makeup was. And this guy found the records and wrote this wonderful book. And I learned things like there were uh, African Americans who had slaves. You, you know, it was a weird, weird kind of very thought out culture of of, of slavery, and he um, and and all of the really strange relationships. Masters would have dual families and 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 like that. And he and he was inspired by all of these records that Virginia kept. And uh, so that's why that book was enlightening to me. It's a work of fiction, though. He just takes these facts and and writes about them. Now you also have Puerto Rican obituary. Puerto Rican obituary is poetry uh, uh, by Pedro Pietri, who's not with us anymore. And he was uh, a hilarious, hilarious uh, a poet who talked about the Puerto Rican experience with such love and compassion. I could tell that he just loved his people so much, even though you know his poems are called like uh, suicide note from a roach in a lower income housing project <laughs> and and like that but uh, i met him when he was hanging around uh, the young lords which as you know was a militant group of the 60s and they kind of intimidated me because they were so political and i didn't really know about history and all of this you know what was Mao Zedong was doing and uh, and all of this but he he was he brought humor to it and I realized you could be an activist with a sense of humor, with some theatricality. Right. And you know, being an activist is also, it doesn't even necessarily have to uh, be the way that people think it does. Even you being a representation for people on television and using your voice because you also did become a writer as well on the show. Right, I, right. I think that he used, I, I always say this to people, we all have a little bit of power. Mm -hmm. We all have some power. I say this to younger people and uh, we just, maybe it's not the biggest power, but you have a little bit. I remember on first on Sesame Street, there was a fruit cart and it had apples and bananas and the usual stuff. And Matt Robinson, who was the first Gordon, said to me, you're not here to be the cute Latina, you know. You're supposed to make sure that the Latino content is accurate. And I'm thinking, who elected me, spokesperson? I'm only 21. I don't even know the front end of a camera. But I remember the fruit cart, and I went to the producers, and I said, you know, if this was a real diverse neighborhood, you would have some platanos here and some. And they went, OK, great. So that was a little bit of power. So I diversified the fruit cart right on. On, right on. <laughs> but it is amazing because things like that, they do matter to people because people are watching the show, kids are saying, oh, we eat that, and I've never seen that before on television, and that does matter. So it's, it is just using your voice, and for people to even see you and say, okay, I can do that too, right. is a powerful thing. And let's talk about you, before we finish the, with these books, transitioning into writing. Oh, uh, um, I used to always read the Sesame Street scripts and I, I would think in my head, oh, this would have been a better line, or oh, this would have been better. And then we used to have these writers meetings uh, with the actors and the writers would say, what would you like to do? And I'd say, I'd like to do Charlie, Ch I like Charlie Chaplin, blah, blah, blah. When they started really using my ideas, it validated my ideas to me, right? Then I thought, wait a second. If it, you know, this means that my ideas were good, and then you know, and there was a very supportive group. And as I would complain about or have thoughts about the Latino <laughs> presentation, the producer said, "You know what? Why don't you try writing it yourself?" So she threw the gauntlet down, and and then I I started to write. You know, I knew the characters, I knew Oscar the Grouch, and I knew what emotions I wanted to get across. <laughs> And you also, on that show, went through a lot of different things that were reflected on the show, as far as your own personal life. Yeah, well, you know, I started out as a teenager, mm -hmm. became a woman, was a feminist for a while, you know, when that was what was happening. And, and I, when I fell in love in reality uh, with Richard Reagan, and I was going to have a baby, they decided to have me get married to Emilio Delgado on the sh show. And, uh, uh, they, you know, w they really thought about it. They didn't want, because we knew each other for so many years, why would we fall in love all of a sudden? 
It will, you know how friends first. Yeah, right? it's just like it's like I take my glasses off and throw my hair back, and it goes whoa. <laughs> That's how it used to be. So they so they 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 thought about how to present him in a different way. So Maria sees him nursing a sick kitten, and she goes, "Oh, so it's based Sweet. on an emotional <laughs> thing." We really thought about it, and pe for many years, people did think we were married, and right. they would say. Uh, uh, we told this woman once that we weren't married, and she went, oh, well, as long as you really love each other. <laughs> let it go with that. <laughs> but even having a baby on and the And then, I, yeah, I had a baby and a sonogram, and, and I nursed. <laughs> yes, and I nursed on the show, and people got upset about that. Right. You know? You have to think that's so forward. People still get upset about people nursing Nur today. Yeah. <laughs> which is crazy. And it was, this was in the 80s. Right. Yeah. So that's what I'm saying, like all of those things that you brought to the show and then being a writer and making sure that you're represented properly, that's so important, I think, as far as activism is concerned. Yes, absolutely. Now, another book you have on here is The Relatives Came. Oh, I love that picture book. Cynthia Ryland is like from Appalachia and uh, it's about this crazy family and they visit each other and there's a, an illustrated character in it that has rollers. And so that's so connected with, I mean, my aunts and my mother had like the dress rollers and this is the everyday rollers, but everybody was in rollers all the time. So when I saw these characters and they were these rambunctious and there was a beautiful line in it where the little, the, all the relatives are visiting and the little girl said, it's gonna take 10 kisses and five hugs if I get, when I get from the living room to the kitchen, cause they were all, so, I mean, that was a familiar feeling to me. I liked it. Okay, and Conquistadora. Conquistadora is a book written by Esmeralda Santiago. And, you know, her first book, When I Was Puerto Rican, is so popular. But she writes so many other things. And this is a, a historical fiction. And she said, poor people don't write down their history like their ancestry often because they're too busy being poor and trying to make ends meet, right. frankly. And so she said, so I made up what could have been her ancestry or a Puerto Rican girl's ancestry, but it's a huge saga and it starts off in Spain. She's the niece of Ponce de Leon, one of the people who came over on the, the Nina, the Pinta and the Santa Maria or something. And how she, as a little girl in Spain, she always wanted to travel and then she gets to Puerto Rico and she's a big landowner. And she has this wonderful affair with these twin men and they never know. <laughs> she plays them off against each other and she <laughs> sleeps with both of them. And it's this, but you get a whole history of Puerto Rico, you know, way when there were Indians there and before it was colonized by the United States. And it's just, it's just a great read. Are there books that you read later in life that you wish you would have read earlier? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I don't know. Uh, I tried reading Faulkner for a while. That was kind of tough. Dense. <laughs> it's very dense, but uh, you know, maybe I'm still not old enough to read him. I, I I don't know. If I think of one, I'll 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 shout it out before. And we were we talking end. earlier about reading the book before you see a movie or before you watch a television series. What are some books that you read the book and that made you want to see the movie or vice versa? Well, the the hate you give. Ooh, that's a great one. Mm -hmm. I wanted to, uh, you know, I was looking forward to. Mm -hmm. I st still think the book is a little bit on more levels than than the movie was, but the movie was 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 very good too. Yeah, that's I'm Angie C. Thomas. She actually has another book. I did her book launch for her next book. It's called On the Come Up, and they're making that into a movie as well. Oh, good for her. But you know what's great about books like that? I think about, I wish I had things like that when I was growing up, because it's a great conversation starter for young women who are going through certain things, and young men, that that book is something a great way to start a conversation. Yeah. You know, I think it's important to encourage kids to read more, because a lot of things, when, and I think they are more encouraged to do that when they see themselves in those pages. Sure. Sure. There's another writer, Renee Watson, you might be aware of her, and I can't remember the name of her, 
the last book that I read of hers, but it's an interesting story about she's an African-American girl and she's like very smart, so she gets all this special attention in Portland. Yeah, I actually did that for my book club too. Oh, did you? Oh, great. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. And that was a great book for us to discuss in that book club because they had girls in that group that they said they never talk in class and they were so excited to come. Just even her waiting for her father to come pick her up and he would never show up. And so many young girls were like, I can, sorry, it's after Father's Day, I know, but um, <laughs> there were a lot of girls in the group that were like, that was me. And, you know, being able to speak about that when they see it somewhere else, because sometimes people think they're alone in a situation until they can read about it. And sometimes people don't have anyone to speak to. That's why I think your memoir is going to be great for people as well, because you wrote your own, Becoming Maria. So let's talk about that yeah. process, because you know I want to <laughs> dig into that a little. So what made you decide that it was time for you to do your memoir? I guess I guess I wanted to uh, reconcile a lot of feelings that I had not solved with my father, mm -hmm. and I started to and I loved Frank McCourt's Angela's Ashes. Mm -hmm. That's a book about the most miserable Irish childhood you could abs <laughs> you could imagine, but it is told with such humor. I would get up and read that book, and one time I, something caught. It was so funny, like coffee shot out of my nose. You know how that <laughs> happens when <laughs> something grabs you? And so I thought, wait a minute, I had misery. I have a sense of humor. Why don't I do this? And so that was an inspiration to write, uh, to write my book. And finally, I had to get to the end. I had to, 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 to talk to my father, and, and uh, everybody should try to write a memoir because your siblings will remember the same event, but differently. Right. It's like we had different parents. I mean, when I said to him, do you know we were going through all of this stuff? And he was going like, what? That didn't happen I mean, in our house. It didn't, I, didn't talk, I wasn't hitting you. <laughs> was it hard for you to be honest? Because I know that's sometimes a difficult thing about what you experience. Because you think about other people's feelings. You think about your recollections of it. You think about wanting to put certain things out there. Because once it's out there in print, that's it. Right. No, I, I didn't worry about that. I was very, uh, I just wanted to get down my, the way I felt, the specific feelings that I felt without, without trying to judge what my parents did. And it's interesting, if you read, after you read of some Frank McCourt, you read Malachi McCourt, who was his older brother, he will write with that kind of, of uh, e expressing his his um, sometimes anger. Whereas Frank was it was always love. Same event. Right. <laughs> Different way to tell the Different story. Different way to tell the story. <laughs> and was it so? I assume it was very therapeutic for you to finally get this down on paper. Yeah, it really was. It really uh, 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 it is very therapeutic. Uh, when I did the audio version, I mean, you, you go through it and you correct and you do it better and it's like polishing a stone, right? You, you do it better and better and better and then I did the audio version. The least thing I thought was going to get me, I started crying. You know, it was, and then she, the, the least, not even a big thing in the book and it makes me think that our emotions, they're like, you know how your brain has all these crevices in it? it they're like that in you and then it comes out when you, <laughs> you touch it and it comes out and that was that struck me right i'm sure so um and i love that you said you think everyone should write a memoir yeah. Like, everyone in this room should, because I'm sure all of our lives are so interesting. I think some of the best memoirs I've read have been from people that aren't famous or that who I have no idea, but I just looked at the cover and the story looked interesting, and I'm like, I could, you know, let me check this out. Yeah, everybody has a, a, a life. There's, I, I, I wish I could remember this wonderful uh, Irish-American, Ann Beatty, is that her name? Uh, she, she writes, they're ordinary lives. Nothing big happens. Right. Nothing happens to these people, but they're so fraught <laughs> with something uh, uh, that you, you you can't put it down. They always say the truth is stranger than fiction. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's absolutely true. Because I, re I read this book about the girl who escaped from ISIS, and 
and it's a true story, and I thought it was an excellent read, but part of what I thought was great about that book was that it really shows how we have these perceptions of what ISIS is, and to show how, for people that might not know, because I know there's a lot of false things that are put out there, but people who are Muslim hate ISIS just as much as we do and are just as terrified. And I think there's this perception of, okay, this person's Muslim, they're ISIS. Like people really are ignorant enough that they think that. But when you read how these families are torn apart and how they think the United States is the place where they need to come to escape from that and what's happened to these young girls, it's really something that I think would change a lot of people's perceptions if they would read a book, you know? Right, right. Or right. get out of their own minds right right i mean putting yourself reading reading is putting yourself in the other guy's shoes and that's uh, uh it, it's enlightening it's the human experience is very very interesting to us all now another book on this list is the warmth of other suns ah yes i don't know how i came about this book i never read stuff like this this <laughs> because i mean it was a fax you know a synopsis and uh, figures of the the Great Black Migration from the South North, okay? So, so these are stories of people leaving Jim Crow South to, 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 you know, and you're reading this horrible things that they have to go through. You figure, oh, they're going to get to the North and it's going to be great. Well, the things that happen in Chicago to certain people and in California to certain African Americans is just as is just as horrible and but what she does is that she she makes the people so specific and real that they're not just numbers anymore they're not just 500 people traveled uh, uh, you know they are very specific life stories and you feel uh you know uh, incidences like uh, in Lake Michigan they were very segregated a young boy goes out to swim, and he inadvertently swims over to the white part of the lake in the water, and it causes a riot. You know, things like that. The doctor from the South tries to go to California, and he can't stay at any hotels, and he can't stop and eat. And it's the little injustices, and then the final blow is when he gets to California and the African American patients prefer a white doctor over wow. him. It, so, so it, you know, the book is full, even though it's not a novel, it's, you know, facts and about, about people. Uh, uh, she gives it those, those details. I mean, why would I remember that? Because right. she put it in there that, you know, makes it alive. It's a great book. And I think sometimes, aside from just books, there's memorable characters from these books that we think about. Who are some memorable characters that you can recall? Oscar the Grouch. <laughs> 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 I mean, I, I, I just... We all know an Oscar yeah, the Grouch, no, right? Oscar the Grouch, but, well, I mean, but I know, I'm Real kidding, life. but you know <laughs> that uh, uh, ca characters live, the good characters are the ones that live after you close the book. Right. You imagine them having dinner, or you know, you imagine them saying, uh, 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 saying things. I love uh, uh, S Sula, uh, uh, Toni Morrison's, uh, uh, was that her name? Sula, right? Yeah, that was her name, and she was so, she's a memorable, tough character, and she, even though she sleeps with her best friend's boyfriend and her best friend is really mad at her and doesn't want to ever be her friend again finally sula said i just slept with him i didn't kill him okay <laughs> it's so interesting how like depending on what mood you're in is what kind of like there's certain books i read on vacation then there's yeah certain books <laughs> yeah that you're yeah. like i wouldn't read this any other time but i just want to relax and not have to think too hard and then there's certain books when you're like okay i want to challenge myself Right, right. I, I mean, I'm. I love beach reads too. I love Elmore Leonard. I used to love a, a guy named John D. McDonald, and they were always like these murder, these kind of sexy yeah. murder mysteries that <laughs> took place in Florida, and and uh, so you know, those th th those are wonderful books too. And and um, you know, there's, I mean, good writing is good writing. It does. It could be a murder mystery, and 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 like that. And it's always a nice surprise, like you said, when there's a book that you like. I don't normally read books like this, 
but then you're like, this one was actually really good. Yeah, it was it was wonderful. But it's so funny when you say about a beach read. I keep thinking of Lin Manuel Miranda, like his beach read was <laughs> was Turn Off Spook Hamilton, you know. And I said, oh, I read. Beach let me see a beach reading, and I tried to get into it. That I'm not going to discourage anybody from reading it, but I haven't been able to get into that. And you know what's crazy? Growing up, I think I read every Stephen King book. I used to love... Oh, of course. I used to love to read his books. And I remember reading It, and that was like the longest book I ever read. And then they made it into a movie as well. But it's always exciting to me when you read the book first, and then you see the movie, and you're like, okay, like Crazy Rich Asians. I read that book because it was in the airport everywhere, and then they ended up doing the movie. And I was like, oh, that's amazing to see what you visualize in a book come to life. Yeah, or what's the famous uh, Stephen King book? uh, uh, Here's Johnny with Jack Nicholson. The Shining. The Shining. (laughs) That was a great book, too. How could I forget Stephen King? I was obsessed with him. Uh, uh, So that, that was a great book. And I don't know if they made a movie of The Stand, but that was also a great book. They kind of got into like different realities and heaven and earth. And, and, and thinner. And, I don't know if you read Thinner. I remember that when the guy, he was overweight and then they put a curse on him and then he just kept losing weight and couldn't stop. <laughs> oh, I don't know yeah. that one. That's like I, the kind of thing you want to do for a little while. And they're like, okay, <laughs> let it stop now. <laughs> just for one week. Just for a week, right. right so right. what made you know that you could write a book? Uh, I started really small. I wrote a picture book called No Dogs Allowed. And um, and I always base everything on my real life experience. And I, and I remembered uh, when we used to go to the beach, we used to go to Lake Welch or Orchard Beach. It was like a, th- it's like a caravan. We used to get up at four o'clock in the morning. We used to have rice and beans. We used to have roast, a uh, whole pork. <laughs> My mother used to used to you know make co- not grind beans thank god but she would actually like you know colar el cafe you know at the beach guitars hammocks I'm thinking why can't we just go to the sand like every other person and just lay here I just want to say that sounds amazing too. Oh my god it was such a to do and then we had to get up early to get us be in the shade You know and you learned a lot of stuff like stay out of the sun you'll get too dark Excuse me, mom, what What did you say? You know, so so anyway, all of those experiences I put um, in uh, my first picture book, No Dogs Allowed, because we, we went, we used to go with this family who had a lot of, because they had a lot of food. I used to like to go with them. <laughs> they used to bring a whole watermelon. To me, that was like, <laughs> so they brought a dog once. And, and in the, what happened was after we went through all this trouble, they had to leave. They could not get into Lake Welch. So I said, that's a sad ending. So I wrote a picture book, though, called No Dogs Up. It's a happy ending. Mm-hmm. <laughs> we can make our any you ending we want. <laughs> that's right. That's right. You can take a life experience <laughs> and, and, and give it any twist that, that, you, that you'd like to. So. Well, that's amazing. So I'm so excited because I've only read uh, bits and pieces of the book. So now I have the book in hand. And I just want to say, I know everybody has all the apps and stuff like that to read, but there is nothing like for real going to the library. There's nothing like having like the hard actual book in your hand to me personally. Like I never read books on, uh, on the Kindle or anything like, yeah, yeah. not that there's anything wrong with that. However you read, please make sure you do, but that's just how I prefer it. It's like books are like artwork to me. So I have libraries all over in my house. And, and kudos to you for being an ambassador for uh, the New York Public Library system. Yes, it that's was exciting. Really, I'm excited. That's an exciting thing to... Thank you. To use your voice to get, you know, people to read books. And I think people have to know that in the library, there's so much more than just books. There's a lot of resources that are available, too. And it's a great date, by the way, if you want to impress somebody. <laughs> come to the library. Look at how beautiful it is, though. Yes. If you want to see if he's smart or she's smart, you know? Right, right, right. <laughs> <laughs> it's important. So now we have time for a Q&A. So if you guys have any questions for Sonia, we're here. Yes. Oh, she's very good. If you guys want to stand up if you have a question, that would be great. So she can identify you. Thank you. And thank you for this wonderful discussion. My, I have a comment and a question. My uh, question is, um, 
which Sesame Street ca character is your favorite to interact with and why? And my comment is in regards to this uh, book selection, I noticed a common thread throughout all the books is family. And for me, growing up, you know, that's what, what's one of the many things that Sesame Street represented was family. And I was wondering if that was a deliberate on, you know, thought process on your part. Thank you. Well, probably not a deliberate thought process, but it's something that obviously came through my choices. I, you know, unconsciously I chose books that have to do with family because, uh, you know, they must appeal to me. Um, uh, Oscar the Grouch is my favorite character on Sesame Street. When I retired, the short answer was 44 years was long enough to wait for Oscar to propose <laughs> to me. <laughs> but c because he's nuanced and, uh, uh, you know, he has a, he's either 40 or 8. You know what I mean? In his voice. You know, he's a little more, he has more depth, and that's why I like him. There's somebody there, you want to... I don't think you would have been happy with No, no. <laughs> Living in a trash can yeah, right now. Not, nah, not me. Yeah, <laughs> yes, peace and blessings, everybody. My name is Maji, and I'm so happy to be here. I came, um, I grew up in the Bronx, in um, East Tremont, when the Bronx was burning, when there was abandoned buildings. And once you see that image growing up, nothing scares you, nothing uh -huh. uh, impresses you. You're like, you're like, what? I moved to Queens, and I was like, what? This is a luxury. But I just want to say thank you for giving us inspiration and hope in those days and times, and today as well. Thank you, thank um, you. Sonia. Th thank and you. And Angela, Angela Yee, thank you. My question is, um, with all the negativity that's going on in the world right now, do you think it's possible that we could see like your book turn into a movie? Because people need to get more inspired of, 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 of you that turned like trials and tribulations into, you know, a business empire, you know? And well, I don't know about the business empire, but <laughs> uh, uh, I, I think that we live, we're living in very, very harsh times now, right, as, as we all know. And as I look for something uh, positive in it, I have to think that uh, more things are exposed. And I have to refer to, I mean, you know, things are out in the open now, as uh, Donald Glover so uh, brilliantly portrayed in This Is America, where, you know, everybody was shocked, and but, you know, it's more out there. So I think that, that something good has to come out of the fact that, uh, that it's not hidden anymore. It's still very hard to, for, well, for, from my experience, to break into the media and have a movie done that that's uh, you know that, I mean there's a lot of great I mean Jacqueline Woodson writes a great book every year that could be Brooklyn Girl and Brooklyn you know, another Brooklyn and all of those books she's a great writer you should read her uh, but it's hard it's still hard to get in but I think that the internet is good because it the watchdogs the gatekeepers are not there anymore. Right. A lot of streams. A there's lot of a ways lot of to get your content out there, right? So that so that's a good thing. Of course, the bad thing is that there's a lot of it. Mm -hmm. There's no curating, but I've seen some really great stuff and real good talent on the on the internet. Is that question? Hello, hello, Hi, everyone. My name is Miss Kate Tannenbaum. Um, I have a to follow suit. I have a comment and a question for Ms. Manzano. Um, my comment is thank you so much, Ms. Manzano, for your work and um, your presentation. Thank you. Although I haven't read your book, um, I wanted to ask, pose this comment in the form of a question. Are you aware of what a positive impact you've made to this country, to this nation, through your work on Sesame Street? Are you aware of how what a wonderful woman you are? And God bless you um, for the work you've thank done. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, thank you. I, I have to say that I never realized how much you and I have had in common, although my dad, and don't don't giggle, Miss Tatum, I know uh, you've heard me this month, um, my dad was a doctor, and he's actually um, colleagues with Big Bird, um, uh, and you might know this already, but mum's the word, um, <laughs> he let me watch your show, and my mother had passed from tragedy when I was seven, and your show, Sesame Street, provided, and this is all confidential, everyone, um, provided comfort to me um, because of 
particularly um, your character, Maria. You provided comfort to me Thank you. for many years. I was able to graduate from PS87 with honors and go on to high school with honors, college with honors, and graduate with a BA in liberal arts. Good for although, you. Good for you. Although, although I had severe, um, you know, personal and psychiatric problems, I did graduate from college, and I, I attribute that to Sesame Street's educational programming and PBS. And, you know, I'm, I'm very um, concerned about this troubling world right now and, and what's on TV and the media, and I, I really would like to read your book. Is it available? Thank you. Yes, it is available. Thank and you I, so much. Thank you very much for your kind words, and, and people have said nice wonderful things to me, but I always like to hear it again. So thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> um, I just wanted to say, um, first to Sonia, I'm 50, and your show started around when I was born, and uh, that's right. It, yeah. it really, it really inspired me. But I do have one question. I also have a question for you, Angela, as well. Why did it take so long for Snuffleupagus to be known? <laughs> I mean, because <laughs> you had Big Bird looking like he was crazy. <laughs> I and I used to always say, is he really there? I mean, am I the only one that, that thought about that? <laughs> uh, oh, well, that's, uh, that's funny. That's... Would, they would always have that, that, dun, 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 that music come on. Yes, and, yes, yes. And he'd be like, he was just right here. Yeah, I'm not I crazy. Know, and I'm I like, know. Oh, you, you did my man Big Bird wrong. And, uh... You know, you <laughs> might find this interesting. Those of you who don't know, the Snuffleupagus is this huge character. And for mm -hmm. a long time, due to, you know, to do a lot of programming, the gag was that we thought he was Big Bird's imaginary friend because yeah. we just didn't see him in the same. Yeah. So Big Bird would say, look, he, you know, and then he would be gone, and, yeah. and then... Uh, it took like about 15 years for I him to come out, right? I don't think it was that <laughs> That's long. That's a long time. I mean, I'm thinking, Big Bird must be going through. He must be traumatic. No, I know. I know. That's... Uh, I, I, we, we killed that gag as long as we could. <laughs> Did it over and over. And then, uh, then as it happened, there were a lot of cases of, and I'm going to like get a little dark here, there are a lot of cases of sexual abuse of children. And the ki what kids would say, what the adults would say to the kid, no, 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 that's just your imagination, which was just what we were saying to, to the bird over, over the mm. snuffleupagus. So we fixed that right away, and then we oh, okay. stopped that, right. you know. Okay. But... Uh, but I, th but I think that that's you know a kind of a reason why you and the show is so popular. Really, be mindful of what's going on in the world, in the country, and and what we. So, so I sincerely apologize. <laughs> no, was not that serious. Wasn't I that hope serious. you didn't have to go to therapy or anything. Or I, anything. Thought, I thought Bird needed some therapy. To be honest <laughs> with you. And one question for Angela. Um, you say you read a lot and, and you inspire, and um, you have a book club. I was wondering, um, do you um read like books by like up and coming authors or is it just gotta be books that are just on the shelves or like I guess indie guys or self-publishing authors? Or? You know, I read a lot of books um, because I enjoy it, but then mm -hmm. I have a lot of books to read still at mm -hmm. home because I have so many because I collect them like art. Mm -hmm. But if I think it looks good, I don't even, sometimes I have no idea who the author is at all. And well, I'm, I'm asking because I'm a Brooklyn guy. I'm from East New York, Brooklyn, mm -hmm. and I wrote a novel. And I would love to add my book to your collection, if even if this is yeah, on the show. Yeah, absolutely, please. Right. Oh, yes, yeah, okay, we're not playing games. <laughs> if you don't Thank mind. Thank you, I appreciate that. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Derek Bonner, East New York, Brooklyn. Holly. Let's take a look. Take it out of the bag so <laughs> everybody right, can see um, it. It's called Havoc and Mayhem. It's set in the 80s in Brooklyn. Ooh. Oh. <laughs> Get a picture, Kevin, my brother right there. He's a and, picture. And um, Zell's for you right there, sis. Oh, okay. <laughs> Promo items. Yeah. Hey, you know, you, you got to get in. You know, I was looking at you both. I'm like, you know, I grew up watching you, and I, I go to work listening to you. It's, you know, it's a little mind-boggling right here. But you Thank know what? Uh, sorry about that. But um, if you get a moment, um, I appreciate it. And um, That's amazing. And there's so many avenues for people to put their books out Good now. Thank you. Congratulations. Yeah. Nice. A little swag. All right, we do have time for one more question. <laughs> So we have time for one more question. So if you want to be here, we have right here. 
Perfect, you didn't have to walk far. Just sure did. Good evening. Uh, my name is Zakia Laji Salahuddin. Um, what I would like to ask is what age would one be ready to write a memoir? And um, uh, I wanted to ask, you said you wrote about your true life story. Now, my son is 44, and he wrote, a, uh, a, I guess what you would call a memoir. And our experiences as African-American Muslims here in America. Now, when you think of Muslims, you normally think of Arab Muslims. And when uh, the media t um, wants to um, look at the lifestyle of Muslims, there's usually from an Arab perspective. So I, I'm, he's kind of nervous about what he's done. And I want you to just say what encouragement would I give him to, you know, you, go You on. mean he feels anxious about what he's written? Yes. Yes. <laughs> I, I, I think that if that anyone can write what, what they want to write. I mean, they, it's a, I guess it's, his tr it's a true life it's story. It's his true story. It's yeah. his life. There's no, uh, uh, I mean, if it's a memoir and if it's his life story and, you know, no one is going to argue with those facts, you just can't put facts that didn't, aren't there. Well, nowadays it's, it's, uh, it's, it's yes, you can. We're but on, in we're writing, on a slippery slope. You can put it on let's Twitter. <laughs> you can say, <laughs> but in, I mean, in writing your, your story though, was there healing between you and your family or, you, or was there more separation? Oh, there was no separation. Not at all. No, okay. no. I think my, my, uh, uh, my older sister just said to me, uh, give me some fair warning. <laughs> If you need That's, to, yeah, and I did not need to. I put her in the most, you know, flattering light uh, that I could because I really feel that. I mean, you know, I'm, this wasn't a vendetta to get back at childhood miseries of being let down by relatives. It was just my feelings, and I think if that's what he's doing, then that's fine. I think that great stories too. You should feel a little anxious about it. Just because sometimes telling your truth isn't an easy thing to do, and it is something I think anybody would be. I'm sure you were a little anxious when your book came out as well. It's not easy to, to do that sometimes. It can be therapeutic, it can be healing, but sometimes you're concerned about how, how other people will receive it and what will happen next, and I think that that's part of the process too. Unless you write something that has no depth to it, in that case, who cares, you know, but, yeah. <laughs> right? Right. But I right. think that anybody would feel, if you're telling these truths that aren't easy to tell, you should feel a little anxious. And I, you know, I was happy that, I mean, some agents said to me, oh my God, but you're Maria from Sesame Street and this happened to you? And I'm thinking like, what does that have to do with anything? Just because I'm on a children's show that's very well known, that doesn't mean I'm always a child or that- You're a real person. I, I'm a real person that things happen to. Mm -hmm. You can't say, uh, you know, just because you work with kids, you can't deny your life because there was negative mm -hmm. stuff in it. I mean, it's a, it's a perception that I was happy to, right. to break. Did you ever feel like you had a certain perception to live up to because you were a character on Sesame Street for so long that, like, I have to portray myself like this? And was it annoying? I, I own, I really feel that Maria was Sonia on purpose. Mm -hmm. I never worried about like having a drink publicly. I didn't care about, about like, you know, anything like that. I, 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 I just never concerned myself with those things. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the, uh, the cast is very much what you see is what you get. You know, I mean, I, we always used to get, I'm gonna write the expose of what really right. goes down, but they were really decent people. I mean, and I think, that comes up, well, obviously there's divorces and stuff like that and, uh, you know, other things. But basically, <laughs> the core of those people are what you see on television. I can tell you that. All right, well, we are so glad to have had you here with us. It's really been a pleasure. Just amazing, like, to meet you as a person and to see how amazing you are in real life. Thank Cause you. Because it's not that often that you see that, so. Thank you, thank you. And once again, kudos to you to, to help, you know, uh, promulgate the cause of, uh, of reading and libraries. Well, selfishly, I get to do things like this, so it makes it all very worthwhile. So thank you so much, and thank you guys for all coming and participating.